ETEC Applied Science Unit 5. Uh, this is the second section, which is about the lungs, basically, the structure and function of the lungs. Pretty basic stuff. That's your head. If you didn't know that, I think you've got problems. Uh, then you've got your chest, which is your thorax. And then underneath that is your abdomen. And that's where all your guts and stuff are. Uh, this video is about what goes on in the thorax, yeah, which is your chest, and in particular, your lungs. So this video is about breathing. Um, now, you need to know quite a few labels. Uh, your windpipe is your trachea, which comes from your mouth. Uh, then your trachea splits into bronchi. Uh, which I believe means branches. So it branches into your left and right lung, your bronchi, uh, and then they split up into bronchioles, which are little branches. Okay, they're made of very tough cartilage um, and they carry the air uh, to and from your lungs. At the end of these bronchioles, we have lots and lots and lots of these little balloons called alveoli. There's about 300 million of them in each lung, these tiny little balloons. So they have a very, very large total surface area, about 130 meters squared, apparently. Very large surface area, so lots of diffusion can happen. And they're surrounded by a capillary network, a network of capillaries, tiny blood vessels. And these blood vessels take oxygen away from them and bring carbon dioxide and water to them. Uh, breathing. Uh, now, well, before we talk about breathing, let's talk a bit more about the structure. The whole thing is protected by your rib cage, which are all these bones surrounding. Have a feel. That's your rib cage. Uh, in between the ribs are intercostal muscles, which help with breathing. Uh, and I mentioned before the diaphragm, which is this dome shaped muscle between the thorax and the abdomen is the diaphragm. Now, uh, the pleural membrane uh, separates the lungs from the rib cage. Uh, and there's actually two membranes. There's the parietal pleura, which is connected to the rib cage, and then the visceral pleura, which is like a, the balloon surrounding the lungs. And in between them, there's a small amount of fluid, because basically, as your lungs get bigger and smaller, uh, they will rub against the inside of your rib cage. So this allows the easy movement. It kind of lubricates this movement. Uh, and it allows inflation as well. It allows your lungs to actually blow up like a balloon. Okay, so the pleural membrane is in between your lungs and the inside of your rib cage. Inspiration and expiration, otherwise known as breathing in and breathing out. Now, what you need to understand is what the muscles do what effect this has on the pressure inside the lungs uh, and as a result of this what happens to the air so first of all breathing in so the diagram on the left breathing in the muscles contract the muscles of the diaphragm contract and this causes it to move downwards uh, the intercostal muscles contract and this causes them to move up and outwards. As a result of this, the volume inside the lungs gets bigger. If the volume gets bigger, then the pressure gets lower because you've got the same amount of air in a bigger volume. So the pressure gets lower. This creates a kind of a vacuum, a partial vacuum, which sucks air into the lungs. So muscles contract, volume gets bigger, pressure gets lower, air gets sucked in. Breathing out or expiration is the muscles then relax. When the muscles relax, the diaphragm moves up 
and the rib cage, because of the intercostal muscles, the rib cage moves in and down. What happens now is that there is a smaller volume, and because the volume gets smaller, imagine you're like squishing a syringe full of air. If the volume gets smaller, then the pressure gets higher, and this means that the air gets blown out of the lungs. Okay, so remember, when the muscles contract, the volume gets bigger, the pressure gets lower, air gets sucked in. When the muscles relax, the volume gets smaller, the pressure gets bigger, and air gets pushed out of the lungs. And that's what causes air to go in and out of the lungs. And you can see that on this fantastic animation that I pinched. Now, gas exchange. Gas exchange, as in uh, oxygen, goes from the air inside the alveoli, uh, and the oxygen diffuses into the capillaries, and the oxygen is carried by red blood cells. Uh, the red blood cells have this uh, pigment called hemoglobin, and the oxygen molecules tag on to it, and it becomes oxyhemoglobin, and it becomes bright red. Okay, so oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the bloodstream. Uh, carbon dioxide is in the liquid of the blood called the plasma, uh, and that diffuses into the alveoli. Okay, so you've got oxygen diffusing into the blood, and you've got carbon dioxide diffusing into the alveoli. Now, you should remember from unit three we talked a lot about diffusion and the different things that promote diffusion. Uh, the capillary walls are very thin, uh, and that means that lots of diffusion can take place. Uh, and there's a small gap between the walls of the alveoli and the capillary network. Um, large surface area, total surface area of the alveoli, we've already mentioned. Uh, it's moist, yeah. Uh, and this basically means, at least the, the top two on that list, means that there's a large diffusion gradient. Now, by a diffusion gradient, it basically means that there's a big difference in concentration over a small distance. Yeah, A big difference in something over a small distance means there's a big gradient. And here there's a large diffusion gradient, for example, between the concentration of the oxygen in the alveolus and the concentration of the oxygen in the capillary, so you get lots of diffusion taking place. Okay, let's talk about breathing. Now, looking at this graph, this is a graph of how much air there might be in your lungs. And if you're breathing normally, then you breathe in and you breathe out and you breathe in and you breathe out. Uh, the first part of the graph and the tidal volume there is just basically when you're breathing at rest, the amount of air or rather the difference in air between breathing in and breathing out, the difference of the amount of air in your lungs is the tidal volume. Okay, if you take a big breath in, okay, then that's your inspiratory reserve volume. So that's the extra air that you breathe in if you take a big breath, the IRV, the inspiratory reserve volume. Then breathe out as much as you can. And the extra air that you breathe out is your expiratory reserve volume or the ERV, okay? You can't breathe out all of the air in your lungs. If you did that, your lungs would collapse, okay? There's always a little bit of air left there, and that's called the residual volume. And then the vital capacity is basically the difference between the maximum volume and the minimum volume is your vital capacity. Uh, and then the total lung capacity would be the vital capacity plus the residual volume, yeah? The total amount of air in the lungs. Do you need to learn all of these? Would you need to be able to label them on that graph? 
And the answer's yes. You need to know these. I've seen it on a few past papers. Spirometry. Spirometry is measuring breathing. Uh, and there's various machines, simple machines and more complicated machines that can do it. But it's basically measuring the volume of air that you breathe in and breathe out, okay, using something called a spirometer. Uh, very useful for diagnosing different types of disease, such as uh, COPD, which we should know a lot about. Uh, basically, you ask the patient to take a deep breath. First of all, they relax. Uh, you put a clip on the nose. Uh, you ask them to take a deep breath and then breathe out as quickly as possible. And then also keep breathing out as much as they possibly can. So big deep breath. And then the nurse will be going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. And then you'll get this graph, hopefully. If it's, if it's taking readings over time, we'll end up with a graph that looks like this, volume against time. And it's repeated three times so that you can take an average. There are two measurements which are very interesting that the, the nurse, the doctor can learn from when diagnosing disease. Okay, the first one is the peak expiratory flow or the PEV. Now, this is the volume of air expelled from the lungs in one quick exhalation. So basically the amount of air you can breathe out in one second. So obviously it's going to vary with lots of factors, your age, sex, height. Okay. But it will give a lot of information about medical conditions such as asthma, bronchitis, COPD. They will all affect your PEV, the volume of air expelled from the lungs in one quick exhalation. You know, the amount that you can expel, how quickly you can expel it, tells us how strong the muscles are. Then we have the forced vital capacity, or the FVC. And this is the maximum amount of air that you can forcibly exhale. Okay, so it's the total amount of air that you can breathe out. This will be about 80% uh, of your total capacity because there will be some residual volume left over. And this will vary with the same factors as before. So the PEV and the FVC, you need to know. The results are usually expressed as a percentage of what would be expected for your age and your sex and your height. So the nurse will take measurements using a spirometer uh, then he or she will look on a chart, okay, and they look at what it's meant to be, or a, a good value for a healthy person of your age and sex, etc. Uh, and 70% apparently is considered okay. For example, uh, a man of height 1 meter 75 who is 50 years old uh, has a, a PEF of 560 liters per minute. It's usually measured in liters per minute. Is that considered healthy? Uh, I suggest you pause the video, look on the graph, see whereabouts that is on the graph, work out the percentage. Is that healthy? And the answer is in three, two, one. Yeah, because it's actually about 92%. So pretty healthy, very, very close to what it should be for a person of that age and height and gender. How does exercise affect breathing? Well, when we exercise, there's more respiration going on in our muscles, so we need more oxygen. Uh, our muscles are creating more carbon dioxide and water. We need to get rid of it. So what effect will that have on the tidal volume, uh, the breathing rate? Breathing rate is breaths per minute. The respiratory minute ventilation. Now, this is basically the amount of air that you breathe every minute. So it's the tidal volume times the breathing rate. I'll show you an example on the next slide. So the respiratory minute ventilation and then oxygen consumption. 
So now the values here are approximate and depend on lots of different factors. So it's just to give you an idea of what effect it would have. Now the tidal volume increases a lot. If you're at rest, then your tidal volume, you breathe in about half a litre uh, a time to about six litres if you're doing heavy exercise. So that can increase a lot. The tidal volume can increase a lot. The breathing rate, which I've said is usually breaths per minute. At rest, it's about 15 times per minute. That can go up to 50 times per minute. The respiratory minute ventilation, which is those two multiplied together. So that could increase using these numbers from 0.5 times 15, which is seven and a half liters per minute, to about six times 50, which is 300 liters per minute. And then the oxygen consumption obviously increases. Why does it increase? Well, it basically increases because the diffusion gradient increases due to there being a bigger difference in concentration. Why? Because you're breathing in a lot more air, you're taking away the carbon dioxide, you're bringing in more oxygen at a faster rate. Uh, and also because your heart's beating faster, so the blood's flowing quicker in your capillaries. Uh, and all of these will increase the, the concentration, the difference in concentration. Uh, and so there'll be more diffusion you'll be intaking, bringing in more oxygen. Here's a graph which uh, you need to understand the effect of uh, exercise on breathing rate. And you can see there looking at it at rest, look at the tidal volume, look what happens to the tidal volume with light, moderate and heavy exercise. OK, uh, and uh, notice that the breathing rate also increases because the humps get closer together.